All right, and hello, and welcome to the episode one of season two of the Amalthea game. Uh, just a few announcements uh, as we get started here. Uh, the first being is that uh, luckily this game is going to stay weekly. Uh, I think every other game that I'm running has gone to every other week, but the good news is this one is staying every, uh, staying every week, so that's the good news. Um, the other announcement I have is that my goal for this season is I'd like to focus a little bit more on the Amalthea crew than, say, the whole fleet at large, so uh, hopefully adventures will be tailored more towards, you know, the Amalthea crew than anything else. We'll still hear from the Lysithia and the Ophion and Dragon Squad, uh, but most, again, the goal is to put most of the focus on the Amalthea people. Um, I think that's really all I have in the way of announcements, so without any further ado, uh, Bishop, if you would like to take it away with Captain Murthrin's opening log. Stardate 63512.0. We're moving into the fourth month of construction on the Graviton Catapult. After the discovery of a Class D world with easily accessible resources five light years out from Suthia, production has been steady and on schedule, with the Amalthea acting as something of a glorified cargo freighter for the majority of the project. Aside from Jenkins depressurizing the entire hangar bay three weeks ago, nothing's interfered with us for the last three months. And ironically, that worries me. The caretakers still haven't shown themselves again. Scouting missions to their home base system have come up empty. It's as if they stripped down every last trace of their presence in the system and moved elsewhere. Without the backup of the rest of Starfleet, I'm reluctant to send individual ships on deep-ranging missions to rediscover them, but even the limited charting of the sector we've done shows nothing. Puts me on edge. Either the half-formed attempt at retaliation we made scared them away, or far more likely, they're consolidating their forces. So the question is, what kind of force takes the better part of half a year to be ready? And log. Alrighty. So, with slightly ominous overtones, we're going to actually start the session with uh, something a little bit different. Uh, and by that I mean uh, Free Pack. I believe this scene is something you've had in your back pocket for a while, so why don't you start it off for us? All right. Uh, free pack uh, is meandering down a hall, a hallway in the lower bowels of the Amalthea, somewhere a little, a little more out of place and uh, away from the usual traffic that you find walking through here. And uh, unlike him, he doesn't have a young ensign woman on his arm. Uh, and he rounds a corner. And comes to a crew quarters door. And he t taps on the pad a little bit. And then uh, says into the pad, Hyperion Beetle Snuff. And then the lock on the door disengages. And as it slides, you hear gentle rhythmic thumping. As if you would have a nightclub, and he walks into his new bar, Plexus. And you see uh, in the back, there's uh, quite a few people around, a few gambling tables, some uh, tango going on. And against the one wall is a bar. And he approaches it, walks around, and kind of starts uh, moving things underneath it. And then he looks up and notices Garrick is sitting there. And indeed, uh, Garrick is sitting at the bar. And uh, as you start to do the quirk thing, he says, Ah, Mr. Freepak, it is good to see you. Uh, tell me, what are we serving today? Uh, oh, uh, a little bit of surprise is what we're serving. I didn't realize... You had the appropriate no uh, knowledge of how to get into here. It's a little more of a well-hidden secret. But I guess I'm not very surprised to see you, Mr. Garrick. Well, you must remember, a Romulan gardener must have many tricks up his sleeve. Oh, I'm, I'm quite sure. Uh, would you like a, some canar? I managed to get some out of the, ha the hands of one of the civilians. For a little bit. He uh, owed me a little something. Oh. Well, 
I appreciate the thought, but never had the stomach for the stuff. All right, what would you like then? I believe we should toast. I hear you are the new star, star base administrator for uh, Alexandria. I am indeed, and that is an excellent thing to toast to. Ironically, do you have any root beer? Uh, un unfortunately, yes, I do. You, you get all kinds of tastes in this place, good and bad. Well, I think it is a perfect way to toast than using root beer. I will pass. But here, <laughs> and he will... He'll put, he will uh, replicate some root beer for Derek. Okay. And he takes the glass and he raises it to you, takes a sip, and he says, Ah, revolting, just as I remember. But it seems you have a visitor. And uh, Garrick points to the door. And uh, walking in is the captain himself. Uh, free pack just goes a little bit more pale than you should have. Ah, uh, the, uh, Captain, pleasure to see you. This is not what it looks like. It's an illicit gambling den, that's what it looks like, right? Well, I guess it is what it is, looks like, yeah. I'm assuming Merthrin just sort of look, keeps looking at him with a measured neutral expression. This is all completely perfectly explainable, and uh, for somehow Mr. Garrick is to blame for this. Let me let me just tell you. That. Well, Garrick motions to you to come over to the bar and sit down. Mirth, and he says, "Come, come. There's no need to stand there all <laughs> ominous like. We all know why you're here." Yep. Yeah. Mirthrin just sort of <clears throat> wanders over and takes a seat, looking. Very comfortable and at ease. Or oh, what can I... Can I pour you something? Are you... Hmm. You know what? I haven't had Ractogeno in a while. Let's see how you'd manage with those. Uh, I will... I will begin... I have, like, a very fancy... French press espresso type machine that I will begin fiddling with in the back, and uh, as I'm as I'm fiddling with it, I'll talk to him. Uh, you know, I, I realize I I didn't ask uh, uh, authorization for this kind of thing, but you know, it 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 really is better to just do instead of ask sometimes. Mm. I do like the decor. Yeah, the, let me tell you, hollow projectors really come in handy. Mm, I can imagine. And uh, uh, but I'm, I'm assuming is that like a view of the planet, sort of the actual window, or uh, no, that I... is uh, something that uh, can either be an actual window to the outside or a hollow image. And what planet it's displaying is up to free pack at the moment. Yeah, it can be anything. Right now, it can be. It, it's just uh, the the uh, Marissa planet below. And as uh, so, uh, as you get your coffee, sort of Bishop enjoys or, his Ractogeno. Yeah, yeah. As I say, so as you get your Ractogeno, uh Garrick uh, turns to you and says, "So uh, tell me, Captain, um, did you tell the rest of the crew as I instructed?" Oh, of course. In fact, I believe they should be here. Mm, pretends to look at a wristwatch. Yep. And right on cue, in walks the rest of the crowd. Uh, Prier walks in, Darval walks in, uh, Rizazo doesn't walk in, but he does make an appearance as well. Glides in stylishly. Mm -hmm. There's just a heavy sigh from... Uh, ripples from in on a bed of cilia. Mm -hmm. He goes, you know, I don't mind, but the whole selling point here was the mystique and the secrecy. You guys have no idea how much that adds to marketing. Oh, not to worry, good chief. I've made sure that only the best are invited in. 
I mean, I certainly won't tell Leo anyone. Will you tell anyone, Priya? No. All I want to know is why were you holding out on us? I, I it was going to get around. You got to build up a base first. You know, you can't just invite everybody in. Here, I thought we were friends. Yeah, sort of, Merthrin will sort of lean over to Darval and go, you know, of course, I can't actually know what he's feeling, but I am in, I'm fairly confident everyone can see the discomfort radiating off the chief at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's in the ears, you can see the ears. <laughs> oh, yes, they, they, yeah, you're right, they do sort of go in a, a, a like, deep mahogany color, don't they? Mm -hmm. Rule of Acquisition 168. Whisper your way to success. Ah, but is there not a rule? I forget the number, of course, but is there not a rule that you should always exploit your friends and family first? Uh, yes, there is. Well, I think that this is the best friends and family you could hope to exploit. <laughs> and uh, Mirth will sort of hold out the glass to whisper to success. You're here. I'll, uh, I'll pour myself something and, and hold it up. I would appreciate a tall glass of apple juice, please. Ugh, Vulcans. I believe I am still technically on duty, and therefore alcohol is frowned upon. Pray we'll lean over. Just make it hard cider. <laughs> uh, that That's another thing, Captain. I, I, don't, I don't run this place while uh, all on duty, and Oh no! Of course, of course not. I mean, and, and otherwise, honestly, I, otherwise I don't... you would have known about this when I uh, sent the disciplinary summons to your quarters. I see. Oh, uh, let me just tell you, I I redid the EPS conduits all through this section. This this place runs really, really lightweight on the power grid. Okay, like it's. Trust me. I, this is this is a specialty. How was the replicator? It was, uh, you know, they're kind of finicky. Kind of finicky. I, I, I would honestly go with a different system. On, uh, as one engineer to another, I trust you to know the limits of the ship. And exactly how to push past them. Chief Freepock, are you aware that there is a slight imbalance in this Davo table over here? I can't help but notice that it seems to be leaning to more unfavorable odds. You know what? I'm going to make note of that and get to that as soon as I can. <laughs> uh, thank you for pointing that out. And uh, Garrick actually just sli actually slides everyone, like including Free Pack. He slides you a uh, strip of latinum and says, "Well, why don't we go and break in the chief's dabo tables? Give him something of a uh, first spin." Rizazo immediately eats the latinum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's not allowed to play. <laughs> this is <laughs> can't eat the profits. The gold is most delicious, but this substance in the middle is irritating and foul. Um, well, don't eat it. Give, you can give it to me. I mean... Uh, he reaches over with his little robot armor and grabs a little glass and kind of um, regurgitates the Latin, Latin into it. Ah, he does the mourn thing. Gotcha. Yes. It's, Three pack uh, grimaces, but takes it <laughs> and sets it, it behind the, the counter. It's like when you get like those thing of chocolates and they turn out to be like the ones with like, you know, rum in them or something like that, but you're expecting like caramel and you're just like, what did I just bite? Mm -hmm. That's kind of Rizaza right now as he's looking at this, what he thought was gold. Gotcha. All right. So I actually came up with uh, some very basic rules for Dabo uh, because Ooh. porting the actual game was way too difficult. So the way it's going to work is um, we're it's basically like a roulette table. And it's going to follow the standard roulette rules of uh, even numbers are black, uh, odd numbers are red, and you can bet on colors, you can bet red or black, you can bet uh, on a specific number, 
Uh, or if you want to say guess a range, like for example, you could guess, uh, I think the standard rule is a range of three. So three numbers, um, you know, very, oh, it, it's more similar to roulette than what we see of Dabo because Dabo rules are all over the place, no matter what fan supplement you look at. Uh, so the way to work is you'll place your bets um, and then uh, I will roll a, a D100. Uh, how, there will be a modifier on the D100, uh, which Free Pack does have odds in his favor because it's his bar. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, what would you all like to bet on? What numbers? I'll bet on I'll evens. Bet on evens. Uh, Mathroom will bet one to three. One to three. Okay. Darval will bet on red. Okay. Uh, Free Pack. Uh, will not bet because it's unfair for the house to play. But he will spend his advantage uh, not actual adva- momentum or anything, but mm-hmm. I'd like, when the captain rolls, I'd like to discreetly step on the base of the Dabo table in order to favor his roll. Very well. Uh, what I will do then is I will roll this secretly and I will tell you all the results. Very interesting. So, uh, what happens is the Dabo Tabo, of course, you know, does that beeping noise as it spins, and then it begins to wind down, and for the briefest of moment, it looks like it would go into the 69 slot, but then it just hops over into the 1 slot. Well, there goes my bar. Unusual behavior, but then again, I was never one to play the de- the gambling There is no substitute for success, let me tell you. There is not. And uh, <clears throat> Nathan will sort of take his winnings. Uh, I suppose next round of drinks on me, then? You said it. That would be logical, Captain. Uh, gathering back at the counter, I guess the free pack is... You know, he, he kind of sidles up on the other side of the counter to the captain. He's, I realize uh, that this is not traditional protocol exactly here, but uh, you know, uh, as an engineer to some extent, and as a Ferengi to a much larger one, uh, I know what people need, and I know what they want, Captain. Let me just tell you that. And let me tell you, when, after standing all day, at their Starfleet consoles and their constricting Starfleet uh, uniforms, people want a decidedly un-Starfleet way of going about their rest and relaxation. And that's one sort of nods and understanding. Yes, I am essentially ca- I am more captaining a highly mobile starbase than a starship, after all. And with a highly High population of uh, civilians aboard as well. And I don't remember any regulations in the book about stopping civilians from enjoying their time. Free pack, I have a question for you. What uh, what species would your Davo girls be? Oh well, with hollow projectors, the. What what deviousness could my mind bring up? Uh, Orions and and all kinds of Rysians and maybe even and hidden in the background a Twi'lek Easter egg. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, because I find it especially funny for some reason, uh, a few Dabo girls come up to Lieutenant Beefcake. Sorry, Lieutenant Derval, and uh, begin flirting with him. I find this behavior highly unusual from holograms. Oh, oh honey. specialty honey. programming. Honey, I'm I'm all real. I I'm not a hollow projector. Uh, unfortunately, she is real, and I do have to pay her. So I just gingerly poke at the hollow at the dabble girl for a second. Yeah, that's warm flesh, all right. It's jiggly. Huh. Either these holograms are extremely lifelike, or you have uh, re- done some very um, creative recruiting practices. You should have seen the negotiations. I'd prefer... I'm glad that I have not. 
Yeah, think of it as a form of, uh, another form of roulette. Are they real? Are they holograms? Who's to say? I know a guy who can get you a hollow suite program. You can't even tell the difference. I will look up at the uh, Dabble Girl. Mm -hmm. Question, have you ever partaken in a backseat joyride of a peregrine fighter flying at 4G through the Jupiter, through Jupiter's, uh, I forgot the term offhand, uh, through, uh, 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 through uh, Ju Jupiter's Lagrange point? Honey, I only understood about half of that, but if you're offering to give me a ride, I'm all game. I find this an acceptable uh, answer. Please meet me at the flight deck at 0700 tomorrow morning. I just want to say I love how in every game, McCall, we hook up with a Dabo girl like every time. And uh, w without uh, breaking, uh, without breaking expression, mouth and all sort of lean back and say, I will say though, Starfleet does have very definite regulations about uh, Dabo girl labor laws, so uh, I, I, I trust you'll keep all those in mind. Believe me, I'm I'm getting the shit end of this stick. She is one hell of a negotiator. I don't know where don't she know picked where she picked I'd like to know. Uh probably Starfleet Academy. I remember her from when I was there. They give you courses on that? That's just unfair. How's a Frankie supposed to make a profit in this galaxy? Well, and this is Garrick. Well, I think that's mostly the point, is that Young ensigns won't go gambling away their latinum stipend on your Davo tables. Well, not your Davo tables, Chief. More like Ferengi Davo tables. You're robbing them of essential life lessons that way. Ah, I suppose you have a point. <laughs> and uh, it is at this point, uh, you know, before we devolve too far into a bar scene, uh, Preer you get a call from one of your nurses and they say uh doc you wanted to know if jensen showed up jensen! i'm on my way oh no no sir i'm calling because he hasn't shown up and usually this is around the time he does thanks for the heads up computer locate jensen Jensen is currently within, uh, and they list off the name and section of the exact bar you're in. Oh, no. Uh, he was, uh, I really wanted to keep him out, but uh, where is he? Well, you all look around. You're not seeing Jensen. Hmm. Uh, Matt Reynolds sort of go, uh, Confusion, where in the... Pinpoint the exact location of Jensen's comm badge. Uh, uh, the computer says working, and then it, it chirps you uh, a set of like directions, and it leads you to one of the sort of emergency Jeffrey's tubes that pretty much every room has. And uh, if you pop open the hatch, you see working in the conduit is one Jensen. So Mertha will sort of open it up, look there, stare at Jensen for a few seconds. How on earth did you get there? Oh, uh, hi, Captain. Uh, just doing some routine EPS maintenance. Huh. I don't remember. I specifically set this section aside from routine maintenance. I've redone this whole corridor. What exactly are you doing? Uh, well, Chief, no, no disrespect meant, but we noticed a small discrepancy in the power draw and... We we tracked it down to this conduit in particular. Oh, Jensen, I mass that. You make me smile. Thank you for being thorough. Uh, of course, sir. And he smiles and he hits his head as he tries to sit up and he says, "Ow, ow, ow, oh, ow <laughs> Here, swap with me. I will. I'll handle that. I don't need you blowing everything up here. I, you don't even understand what I've done. Come on, you're going to mess everything up. Get out of here. <laughs> so as that all yeah. happens, uh, Captain, you actually get a hail from uh, Hamasi from the bridge. <clears throat> Captain to Hamasi, go ahead. 
Uh, well, sir, uh, don't know if it's anything really worth noticing, but uh, we're almost ready with the next load of materials to head back to Suthia with, or Suetha. Um, but something I've noticed, uh, you know, before we've headed out, is that there's uh, strange and indecipherable radio sign signals coming from a system about two days distant. I thought you might want to know. Hmm, interesting. Well, deep space radio signals have always been one of my favorites. Tell you what, uh, you don't really need me for the trip back to Suethia. I'll organize an away team. Go and take a look. Very good, sir. If you tell me what crewmen you would or officers you would like to join you, uh, shall I arrange your favorite Callisto? Uh, yes, please. Um, I think we'll be going with, and I shall list off whichever characters everyone's taking along. Yep. So let me uh, let me briefly put us on theater of the mind. Uh, Falk is working on a Callisto bridge for us, so eventually we oh, will sweet. have a Callisto bridge. But for the moment, we just have theater of the mind. So uh, the captain is going, uh, and I need to know who else is bringing along what characters. Uh, sort of to set the scene, uh, this will be. Uh, an important away mission, so make sure you're taking a character you're invested in. Darval will take the helm. Okay, I've got Darval. I think Rosazo will definitely come along to keep the captain alive. Alright, so there's Rosazo, there's Darval. Prayer will come along because science and medical is my specialty. Alright, so Prayer will come along, and then uh, Free Pack, are you coming as yourself or are you bringing a supporting character? Uh, definitely don't want to leave the ship without its chief engineer. It looks like Liru is a, uh, engineer. Well, what I'll say on that is, um, you know, as Mirthrin said, you are running basically a mobile starbase. You can probably get away for a little bit if you wanted. All right. You know, I initially the uh... here is literally just going from point A to point B over and over. Exactly, yeah. I initiate the emergency bartender program. Ah, and, the uh, EBH. Can... Yes. Which looks surprisingly like free pack. Mm-hmm. Or, you, you know, when you've, when you've got it right, you want to keep it that way. Truth. That depends on your opinion. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, you guys head to, uh, well, out of curiosity, uh, which Callisto would you be taking? Because it does make a difference. The good one. Well, they're, <laughs> they're all good, but, you know. I, I mean, said f uh, Captain's favorite one, so probably the Europa. The Europa, okay. I'll just throw the token on here and make it a little bit bigger so that uh, if we need to track stats, it'll be there. All right, so... Uh, the five of you, plus a standard complement of crew, head to the Europa, and uh, you take the coordinates given to you by Ensign Hamasi, uh, pass them along to Darval, and you start heading out in that direction. And uh, there is a travel time, unless you would like to go to Warp 9. Uh, it's about two days distance at Warp 7, so if there's any scenes anyone wants to handle in transit, now is the time, otherwise we will skip ahead. Uh, I had a uh, something I'd like to chat with with Free Pack, actually. Sure. So let's say that uh, during transit, uh, you uh, pull Free Pack aside and have a uh, conversation with him somewhere. <clears throat> Chief Free Pack, I'm interested in. I'm not entirely certain if the term is employ, perhaps, but adv ask for your advice as a consultant. I am attempting to prepare a relay race around the USS Amalthea for all interested personnel, and I would be most interested to hear about what Jeffrey's tubes or maintenance hatches might be a decent uh, both size for most participants. That's pretty, uh, quite an interesting take on a relay race. There. Well, I, I apologize. Perhaps the better term would be a uh, extreme race? Obstacle course, perhaps. Hmm. Well, you get a pretty good run around the uh, the ones along the outside of the hall, but if you want to add some uh, obstacles there, you could 
divert through the Jeffrey tubes that run through the uh, med bay. They get a bit of windy around there. Quite a bit uh, narrow. Real pain in the ass for fixing, let me tell you. You're welcome. <laughs> Interesting. I appreciate your insight. And what would be a suitable prize? I'm not 100%. I do not understand currency or competition like a Ferengi does. Oh, well, let me tell you. Uh, since the uh, regulations are a bit if. for use. Sorry, you cut out halfway through. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you now. That's odd. I had a uh, hiccup with my connection. Uh, I've invented my own currency for use in Plexus. I, I, uh, I have a, a kind of one-for-one one, uh, trading. Bring me something to trade and I will convert it into into a uh, pack box for use at my tables and then you can bring it back and i've got an assortment of things that people have traded in to trade for He's i'm willing to put up chucky e. cheeses i just want everyone to say i was just about here. to say that <laughs> yes it was just they all have my face on them <laughs> i got an really... what is this chucking and cheeses you refer to <laughs> I'm willing to put up a substantial amount of pack bucks as a prize. As you know, you, you've got to you've got to uh, advertise. You know, if you want to draw the crowd in. This is understandable. I am not completely, f or market basic marketing is not completely foreign to me. Very well. If, I, uh, I can put together a ad campaign, perhaps. And see about perhaps um, interesting some part some participants in my race and use this as a marketing plan for your bar. Sponsored by Free Packs Plexus, I can see it now. Free Packs Plexus, understood. I'd love to see a Vulcan uh, ad campaign though. Wow, that's you gotta run that one by me. It will be efficient and to the point. I bet. Come, race, have fun, have fun, <laughs> win, much prize. Much prize, very wow. <laughs> oh, I love it. I shall come up with some interesting phrases. I will run them by you, just in case. All right, well, uh, if there's any other prizes I can help you with, uh, maybe a... Uh, indetermined amount of time privately with a hollow Dabo girl. So that was not a act so that was not actually Ensign Devar? Oh that she was she's a hundred percent real and quite quite a pain in my side. Best best investment though. I mean you you can't beat flesh. You pay for what you get, and I'm paying her a lot. And not in even a pack box, let me tell you. She didn't fall for that one. Must resist urge to make all hail the new flesh joke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, that oh, that relieves me. I was looking for... I was eagerly anticipating our uh, flight time. But that will have to wait. Good day, Chief. All right, you have a good time now. All right. So, uh, any other scenes people want to have between the uh, "quote unquote" main senior staff before you guys arrive? I got nothing. All right. Good. In that case, uh, we will have you guys arrive, and uh, as you drop out of warp uh, on screen, you see a uh, standard sort of solar system. It's got a uh, Type G star. Uh, almost soul-like. Uh, it has several planets, four in, four in all. Uh, the first two closest to the star are Class Ds, uh, fairly unremarkable. Uh, the Class M, uh, that is the third planet, is probably a little bit more interesting. And then there's a uh, smaller gas, well, not a gas giant, but a gas planet 
that is the fourth uh, planet that is out from the star. Uh, and yeah, uh, assumedly you guys head towards the Class M? Question mark. I'd like to do a system scan. Okay, that's going to be a uh, reason and science uh, difficulty of one. I and will do that because I have a sensor's operation focus. Oh yeah, let's let let's have Prier do it, and then uh, Free Pack. Why don't you roll for the Europa? Uh, the Europa is going to be rolling a sensor's science, and I have to so double check the science. Europa. No, the Europa does not have advanced sensors. All right. Okay, well, uh, one success is all you needed, so no momentum, unfortunately. But uh, what you do learn is that the radio signals that Hamasi had pinpointed are indeed coming from the Class M planet. Uh, They're still undecipherable. Uh, The Universal Translator is, of course, trying to do its best, but it has yes to decipher, you know, what the actual syntax or if it's even a language. Captain, looks like we're where we need to be it's coming from the class m all righty let's do a quick scan for sort of existing life signs and then set, set down aye sir we should also do a quick sweep for caretaker drones <clears throat> awesome um, good night. Are- are we able to see if there's anything in space or in orbit around the planet? Well, uh, normally that would be a question, but uh, I'll give this to you free. Uh, no, there does not appear to be uh, anything in orbit of any of the planets. It's literally just you in the system. Uh, but as you maybe get closer to the planet, you do notice that there is a strange sort of surface pattern to the planet. Um, it's almost as if there are these great geometric shapes uh, that are connected by these long lines. And the geometric shapes are the size of like a large city on Earth might be. So they're big. Um, otherwise, you're seeing grasslands, like you're seeing a lot of green. But the geometric shapes, whatever the hell they are, are definitely noticeable from orbit. I put one on screen. Mm -hmm. and as you do put one on screen uh something happens suddenly before you really have a time to react to it a blue beam um lances out from a portion of the planet and impacts the ship and immediately uh lights flicker and consoles go dark and people are flung out of their seats and immediately uh the lighting on the bridge goes completely dark uh as does the view screen Captain, I'm, de- I'm beginning evasive maneuvers. Uh, is that wise when we can't see where we're going? I'm going to attempt to get emergency power back up, Captain. Okay. Are there shields? Can we get shields up? Please, yeah, please, please do before we lose all heat. Yeah. So, a lot of questions here, so I'll try to answer them. Uh, and if I miss one, just let me know. So, first thing you're noticing, you have zero helm control. So, evasive maneuvers probably aren't happening. Uh, the power, uh, is failing, but your, you know, the crewmen that you've brought along are panicking a little bit, uh, so you're gonna need to calm them down before, you know, you try anything, otherwise it'll be at an increased difficulty. Uh, and that goes for pretty much every department on the Europa, uh, these are probably a greener crew, so they're a little bit shaken by this, like, it's been months since something hit the ship, so they're, they're a little bit phased. Um... The other thing that you notice is that you've immediately lost power to weapons. Uh, shields are up, but they are draining fast. And I think that's everything unless I miss something. So it's just a matter right, uh, of where do you want to begin? Uh, now remind me, can can the Callistos make planet full? They can indeed, yes. Is there casualty reports coming in? There are many casualty reports coming in, yes. I'm going to run to sickbay. Okay. Uh, Freepak is immediately screaming at his crew. Uh, Johnson, Cortez, get it together here. Cortez, I need you to start bringing up the power grid. Cortez, Cortez, get down. uh, Johnson, get down into the uh, emergency power unit. I need a, 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 a full reboot of the emergency systems. All right. 
uh, for free pack. This is going to be a presence plus engineering task with a difficulty of two. All right, I've got uh, emergency repairs as a focus. Does that come into focus? Um, I'll let it happen, but if you have something like uh, Team Leader or Team Dynamics, that would apply better. No. Alright, I'll let you have the emergency repairs then. Alright, so, uh, Free Pack, uh, Johnson, as it were, says, uh, Sir, there, there's fires everywhere, and, and you, you hear, like, a muffled explosion through his comm, and I'm pretty sure one of the deck plays just gave out. Well, Grab the emergency, the uh, fire suppression unit out out of that of that uh that box there. I made the roll, but it didn't appear. Oh wait, it did. Appear. It did. You got one. Uh, Lag for me. Uh, um, uh, quick question: Are our tricorders still working? Yeah, thankfully your tricorders are still working. All right. Uh, Mershon's going to sort of pull the panel off the sensor console in the Callisto bridge and attempt to pull a copy of the sensor logs just before everything went black. Okay. Uh, Let's see if he can moment... figure out what figure out what kind of thing made the ship uh, go down. Right. Uh, at the moment, you are without power, so you can't even pull logs. So uh, you do need to restore power. That is kind of the the operative thing that has to be accomplished before yeah, like even be... turbo lifts will work. All right. So the tricolor on its own can't give enough juice. Yeah, not enough. All right. <clears throat> All right. Uh, he's going to reach the planet. Well, uh, if you had to guess based on the inertia that you're feeling and uh, your location before everything went dark, uh, you were in uh, extremely high orbit, and you're probably getting closer and closer as time passes. Yeah, that's what I wanted to know. Okay, we are coming down because mm -hmm. we would have been probably using repulsors unless we'd gone into pure free fall orbit, which I'd imagine starships don't generally do because they don't need to. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so I, I think Merth, first thing Merth was going to do is going to see if there's like any like spit power banks or capacitors in the bridge that he could use to like a uh, jury rigger power supply up to the computers in the bridge long enough for him to pull some sort of data okay um <clears throat> i would say that if you coordinate with free pack um i will make this uh, and this will be not only for the bridge but for uh, emergency uh power itself uh if you will do both of you will do a reason engineering with a difficulty of a let's make it a four with some threat mm-hmm uh, free pack. H how do you feel about Rend about getting this Callisto down to the planet, but then being more or less inoperable for the n near future? Uh, I think it sounds a whole lot better than getting it to the planet in a crash. Okay, so because uh, I'm thinking of using jury rig to get this to work. All right, so, I, I, uh, I can jury rig as well. You. So, uh, Merthron will sort of calm down free pack and go, hey, uh, free pack, how do you feel about doing a, uh, emergency cold boost bypass on the reactor? Uh, I feel a whole lot better about it than smearing myself across the ground. Uh, yes. I did one of those around, a. uh, a neutron star during a race once. They're they're a bit finicky on the system. I'm going to blow a few conduits doing this, so I'd suggest you uh, get as much crew away from them as possible. Yes. I mean, normally I wouldn't suggest it to burn the reactor out, but, I mean, I, I'd say, given what, what position we were in and the angle we were at, I'd say we've got less than an hour before we start burning up in the atmosphere. Right. Well, once we're down, I'm going to need time, so... Try not to get anybody shooting at us. Yep, I'll, I'll I'll switch all the bypasses up here when the bridge activates again. Uh, can can you handle the uh, hard wiring the reactor? I'm already on my way through to it. All right, call me when you're in position. All right. All right. Uh, all right. So 
Uh, my reason engineering is let's see, twelve plus five, so that's a seventeen. What's yours? A uh, eight five. All right, so I will do the leading. Uh, I can't. Do, can I use my talents to uh, when I'm assisting? Uh, well, as long as your talents do not add additional dice, yes. It's only uh, if you assist, you cannot, no matter how you get them, you cannot get bonus dice. All right. Well, jury rig reduces dice, doesn't add. Okay. Uh, reduces okay. the difficulty. Yeah. Right. Oh, I see. Two. So if you both use jury rig, that brings it down from a four to a two. Mm -hmm. Which is significantly easier to pass. Actually, bring it down to a zero because I guess we both jury rig on its own reduces it by two to a minimum of zero. Oh. Well, right. Although, so... although the difficulty to repair it again increases by one because the repairs fail after the scene. Okay, right. so just so you know, you are aware of this then. If you do both jury rig, the difficulty to repair is going to be a five later on, just so you know. Right. right. Basically, we're trading, getting everyone safe onto the planet in exchange for being more or less stranded for the rest of the session. Mm -hmm. Which is why I've said <laughs> I need space to work and preferably without a gun to my. Okay. So, I mean, if you guys both want a jury rig, it's a difficulty zero. You're literally rolling to see what momentum you generate. Yeah, just We're still rolling to that momentum. Uh, so, uh, whoever is doing the actual roll is doing 2d20, or, you know, if you want to give me threat for additional die, you can do so. Uh, whoever is assisting is rolling 1d20. I will go with the 2d20. Okay. All right, looks like we've got a reason engineering from free pack. That is a one, so that's already one success. <clears throat> and one from Earthrend, you guys Earthrend. are up to two. So yeah, uh, between uh, the two brightest, well, possibly brightest uh, engineers in the fleet, uh, you guys get the reactors purring, or the equivalent thereof, uh, enough that the lighting uh, and power begins coming back to systems across the ship. Uh, in the process, though, uh, you both feel and hear muffled explosions as further parts of the EPS conduits and the hull give out. Uh, and uh, before we go to sort of winces so, as a particularly nasty sound. Oh, that sounds like the port warp coil. Mm -hmm. Your uh, prepack. There's an explosion behind his voice, and then a, like a twisting of metal. He's like, "You're gonna want to set this thing down now, like ASAP." Darval, I'm, hope uh, your flying's good. Captain, I would not be here if my flying wasn't good. All right. So and, before uh, we get to Darval, though, uh, I do want to cut to Preer. So Preer, uh, you you know made it to sick bay, and uh, you've actually got an advanced sick bay here on the Europa. So you are equipped for triage, um, which is good because you are just getting patient after patient rolling into your sick bay. Um, so the way this is going to work is you are going to be doing a presence plus medicine, uh, to both perform triage and to coordinate triage with your assistance. Um, this is going to be three separate roles. So three separate presence plus medicine. They're each going to be difficulty one. And if you fail any of these, death is on the table for an NPC. Understood. Emergency medicine would work for focus? Most definitely. Would xenobiology work for a focus? Uh, I'll give it to you because uh, they're not just humans or they're not just trill or et cetera, et cetera, that are coming into your bay, yes. All right. I have dedicated xeno focus xenobiology as a talent. So ah. each d20 that generates two successes also generates one bonus momentum. Very nice. So presence plus medicine... So right. first nice. one, so first, first one gets you one momentum. I'm going to use a momentum for a third die. Okay. Because cautious. Okay, so that's uh, another two successes. So another momentum. I'll re-roll that zero just because I have cautious. Okay. 
plus a bonus momentum. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. So uh, I believe you're up to four momentum total at the moment. No, five momentum total. Yep. And I'm going to use a momentum for a third die on this one as well. All right. Very nice. You uh, you are not only capped, but you have two floating momentum. So you could create an advantage here if you so wished. Um, I could create an advantage. I'm trying to think of an advantage I could create. Um, I can't think of one off the top of my head. How about uh, you have uh, you you set up emergency bedding because you're going to get keep getting pe more and more people coming in. So you could create an advantage where you've already got everything you need set up for them showing up to I have, decrease I have, the risk, to decrease the the uh, difficulty of future rolls. I have pre-set up conditions for triage. Okay. So I will say between uh, the advanced sick bay and your triage is that any patient that comes in, unless they are like severely injured uh, mechanically, if they take like a lethal injury, um, you will have problems. Uh, you know, like you'll have actual difficulty, but anything that is not a lethal injury is a difficulty zero to treat. Understood. All right. So with that advantage and this momentum, be, and the reason I went to you is so that we could generate some momentum, we go back to the bridge, uh, and Darval, uh, your console is coming back to life, uh, very basic functionality, but it should be enough for you to make planet fall. Well, falling to the planet was going to be a thing anyways. It's falling gently, that is the what I'm trying to achieve here. Mm-hmm. Uh, so daring plus con? Yep. Uh, and I should say uh, that you could attempt to stay in orbit. Uh, the The thing is, though, if you stay in orbit, the beam that has enveloped your ship probably is going to continue making things worse. Yeah, that's why I'm going to... Rule one of fighter pilots, avoid enemy fire. Fair. Um, so let's... Let's see. Could I assist by... Uh, rerouting some EPS power to the impulse engines to give him a little bit more control. Um, or even the, like, the, uh, I will say if... Thing. Oh, sorry. What was that, Jester? Or like, uh, diverting power to like the inertial dampeners, making things more maneuverable. Yeah. Uh, I will say that you can spend two momentum to create that advantage if you so wish. Uh, but this is going to be primarily Darval and the ship rolling. And so that you might know if this advantage is worth spending. Uh, Darval, this is going to be a daring and con for you. Okay. And the Europa is going to be assisting you with an engine's con. Mm -hmm. And the difficulty here is going to be a five after I spend some threat. Ooh, -hoo. fun. Okay, so, so it do does we want to sound... we want to spend for that advantage? Yeah, that would be a good idea. All the Europa right. is shooting for a 14. Okay. So we'll spend the two for that. Um, I'm going to buy with threat for an extra dice. Okay. And I have pushed the limits, which means that uh, due to and damage to the engine, I reduced the difficulty by one. Okay. So it's now difficulty three. Four, was it? Three. Difficulty three. I can do this. Okay. You're uh, the com 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 beat bad bait beefs. Yo, Lieutenant Beef, I'm uh, I'm sending you some extra power here. Lieutenant Beef, Lieutenant Beef. <laughs> Thank you, Lobes. <laughs> oh uh -oh. dear. Um, hang wow. on. <laughs> um, so I get to reroll at least one of those dice because <laughs> I have bold con. Mm -hmm. Might want to reroll that complication. Yeah, I'll reroll that one complication. Whoop, that's the amount, yeah. I got the um, Europa. Okay. okay. So Europa came through good, so all I need to do is get a one from this. I can do this. Just pull. Oh, dear. Nope. Um, okay. So, unfortunately, because you didn't get any successes, the Europa's dice doesn't matter unless you spend determination here to reroll that pool. I think that's going to be necessary. I will spend the determination for a full reroll. Okay, what is the value you are tapping? 
there is much to prove and many people to prove it to. I think that applies, yes. So go ahead, you may re-roll all three dice. Uh, free pack is in a tight... Uh, well, I at least succeeded, but there's a complication. So Ooh. we're going to land, it's just going to be bumpy. Yep. Okay. So Cortez, is... brace yourself. Yep. Captain, I recommend uh, engaging restraining devices as I quickly buckle myself up. <laughs> All hands, All... brace. Yeah. Um, I'm basically going to supersede the captain on this. All hands, brace for impact. Okay. So, you know that scene in Generations where the saucer section of the Enterprise-D just makes a collision with the terrain and then slides for a few kilometers? Yeah, that's kind of what's happening here. So, you are able to get through the atmosphere relatively cleanly, but as you sort of break the cloud layer and begin skimming above the grasslands, uh, you lose, due to that complication, you lose attitude control. And your uh, ship dips very suddenly, and just the nose of it uh, begins digging and scraping and causes everything to lurch forward. Uh, the power to ex you know power conduits begin exploding. Uh, you know, in general, it's just not a good thing. It's, it's a crash landing, basically. Um, and you skid for what feels like hours, but in reality is maybe a few minutes. Uh, and when the ship finally lurches to a stop uh, and you're able to look around and get your bearings, uh, there is uh, just the air is filled with smoke and the acrid smell of burning material. Um, there is debris from the rocks that every Starfleet uh, captain puts into their bridge consoles, because why not? Um, there are some injured, uh, individuals that were thrown out of their restraints, and I'm actually, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna treat this as, uh, two breaches to structure. So, mark down two breaches to structure, as well as a breach to engines, because you did jury-rig them. Uh, and I'm gonna roll two challenge dice here to see if either of, to see if any of the named characters are lethally injured. So, first challenge dice, nobody is injured. Second challenge dice, nobody is injured. All right. So thankfully, uh, you you five, uh, Free Pack, Durval, Mirthrin, Razazo, Prier, you're fine. You have no injuries to speak of. Uh, however, uh, especially for Prier, uh, you have quite a number of patients now. Incoming. So I'm starting Jensen to... falls out of the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it, Jensen! <laughs> now, if I really wanted to be mean, I'd make them Talarian hook spiders, which, as we found out on Akagi yesterday, are a big deal. <laughs> Captain, are you injured? Captain? His vocal cords are. Uh-oh, I think we lost Oops, Bishop. Sorry. Um, uh, alive, I think. I apologize for the roughness of the landing. The damage to the engines were more extensive than I had predicted, and apparently emergency thrusters 1 through 4 had blown out without giving proper warning. Uh, well, good, th good thing Starfleet makes them rugged. Uh, Free Pact will claw his way up to a readout. Uh, engineering to the... So you actually don't get the bridge. In fact, every single console except those in sick bay are out. Oh, lovely. A uh, quick, quick question: uh, Do we have shuttle pods on the ship? Uh, the Callisto does have the same sort of shuttlecraft. I forget the class off the top of my head that the Defiant has, as type well. 10. Type ten, uh, as well as a few worker bees. But definitely not enough to get the entire crew off. I also imagine that, like, the Defiant, it comes out at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So it's probably, like, buried underground. Yep. Captain, I cannot be of any yep. use here. I will attempt to aid Prier in sickbay. Agreed. Let's, let's get a head count, make sure everyone's accounted for, and uh, then start assessing the damage. Wine, tri trip that safety switch on that plasma fire. Uh, Cortez, you need to get Johnson to sickbay for those burns now. 
Lieutenant Rosazzo, are you injured? Or shall I find a spatula to peel you off the ceiling? I am fine. Sorry. I did not think to adjust my restraints when I took the, the tactical position. It was obviously sized for someone much smaller than me and myself. Thankfully, I did not land on my back, and my shell and carapace protected me from harm. Uh, I'm going to roll a challenge dice here for something funny. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Hey, Rizazo, remember when your voice synthesizer was Irish? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I get up and it shifts slightly. There's a spark and a scent, um, scent of burning uh, metal. All right. So I suppose whatever should go out on a little bit of a soiree. Maybe uh, investigate through one of the uh, access tubes. See if we can get it, um, whatever terrain we've appeared in. It appears that you have had a slight uh, malfunction in your, um, your universal translator. However, it is barely noticeable. And I will tr step into the turbo lift out of habit, realize the turbo lift is broken, shrug, and then head down the, uh, uh, the emergency ladder. Okay. All right, so uh, we'll sort of cut to uh, Prier and Darval in sick bay. Uh, Prier, again, you've got patients rolling in every second, kind of a thing. Uh, so this time, uh, I need you to roll me another three presence plus medicines here. Um, the difficulty is going to increase though because you are running. Well, let's do it this way: the difficulty will still be a one. However, uh, the complication range will increase to a 17 to 20. Um, and the way this will work is uh, it will be... Uh, let's do two rolls instead of three. Let's do two rolls, still difficulty one. And if you fail any of them, uh, you will lose five patients per failure. Understood. I'm going to buy a die with momentum for my cautious medicine. Okay. Okay. Wow. Ooh, nice. And dedicated focus to xenobiology. Each of those is an additional bonus momentum. All right, hold on. Let's do math here. Uh, so that is six momentum, which brings you up to nine momentum. So you have three. Mo you have three that are floating at the moment. <laughs> You're wondering what he's going to spend those on. I will say that if you spend two of the floating on the advantages, you were prepared for this. You don't even have to roll the second thing. That's what I was gonna say. Like, we'll use the floating momentum as uh, prepared. Uh, when we got the alert that it was braced for impact, we were ready and raring to go for ink casualties. Cool. <clears throat> so, uh, actually, what happens, Darval, is uh, you emerge eventually out of the Jeffries tubes into sick bay, and Pure seems to have everything under control. Ah, uh, Lieutenant, welcome. Doctor, I'm here to assist. I do not need any medical attention myself. Well, thanks. Uh, help as people come in, but we seem to have everything under control. Understood. I will. With your permission, then, I shall attempt to find an egress point onto the planet's surface. Sounds like a good idea. All right. So, uh, we'll have, uh, let's have, uh, Darval, Mirthra, and Rizazo working on the egress. Um, so I need you guys to roll me, all three of you, to roll me a fitness security, uh, difficulty two, to see how well you navigate through the, uh, blown out corridors and the breached hall, etc., etc. Chief Freepak, I must admit that this is a far more interesting obstacle course than what I was planning. So that was fitness what? Fitness security. Well, when we're not uh, all dying of plasma explosions down here, I'll get a couple of scans so you can recreate. Okay, so Darval has one success. Uh, Rosazzo has rolled a complication in one success. And then what has Mirthrin got going on? I will tell you in a second. <clears throat> Where is my fitness? Uh, 
Um, yeah, don't think I've got any. Uh, what you call it? Focuses. Focuses that apply. Okay. Nope. So each of you is going to take two stress worth of damage as uh, you, you know, kind of, you know, maybe nick yourself on a, an exposed piece of uh, metal or something of that nature. Uh, Rizazo, uh you are actually going to lose your phaser in all of this process as part of that complication. I'm just walking down the hallway and my weight causes the floor to give way and crunch. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Uh, but the good news is that even though uh, you did take the damage, you do find uh, a way out onto the surface, and I can finally move us maps. Uh, when you emerge out into the light, uh, you see that you are uh, actually nearish a very expansive sort of lake bed, very shallow one. Uh, but what's really catching your attention are the very large monoliths that are in the distance and these monoliths are stunning for a few reasons um the first is that they have to be at least 10 kilometers in height uh and the diameter well let me reverse that the diameter is 10 kilometers and the height goes up into the clouds um but probably what really is catching your attention is the fact that they appear to be made out of a single piece of material, like a single piece of rock, as you're not seeing any seams or areas of joining. Just, it's a model, it's a pure single monolith. And uh, sort of to, you know, put this in where, where you are with technology at the moment, the Federation could do this, but it would involve a lot of time and more or less carving up a moon. Yeah. Plus, I can't think of many materials off the top of my head that have the internal strength needed to support that much weight in a vertical position. Mm-hmm. Like most kinds of stone and metal would just collapse under their own weight. Mm-hmm. Perhaps what we're seeing, sir, is just a hollow exterior. Perhaps inside these monoliths is a more robust structure? Uh, potentially. How close are we to one of them? I would say that the nearest one is about a 90-minute uh, walk, uh, and the walk is going to be fairly pre- pleasant. Uh, it's just going to be over rolling gla- grasslands, so it's just a time commitment to go that far out. Um, just looking uh, back at the ship now from the outside, is any of it still on fire? Uh, there are some fires raging, but the emergency suppression systems thankfully seem to be handling it. Uh, that or actual crewmen are out in EV suits just spraying fire suppressant material everywhere. Hmm. Captain, I must apologize again. This is not a landing that I will fondly remember. Hmm. Any landing you can slither away from. I smirk ever so slightly. Well, uh, since we do have a geologist with us, um, I'm actually quite curious to go take a look at these things. I am indefinitely intrigued. Um, Very well, Captain. I have... I have nothing to fly. Mm -hmm. And generally, just out of character here, it would be a good idea to figure out what these things are so they don't shoot us back down again. I mean, that's always a good idea, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're either solid pieces of rock created for some weird purpose, in which case this is stellar engineering on a planetary level, Mm -hmm. or they're gigantic habitation modules of some kind. The shape could also indicate some sort of crystal. Perhaps just covered mm. in sediment. Possibly. All right. I would need to taste it to be sure. I mean, I, don't, I probably need to get a taste of it to be sure. <laughs> Barks in and out. Yeah, I'll, I'll say you can just rotate through whatever voices you wish at this point. Uh, it doesn't have to be the Irish. 
Um, but let me say this. So it feels like Prier and Freepak are going to be stuck, quote unquote, you know, either tending to the wounded or right. coordinating repairs. Um, you could go with the captain if you so wished. Uh, but this might be a good opportunity to introduce a supporting character that we can say has been on the ship the entire time. Well, Freepak is going to call his uh, engineering teams around him in, in the main engineering bay. For, okay. Uh, then he's going to split them up into three teams. And uh, Team A, he's going to give them a pad and say, All right, I need you guys to get the reactors back up. I need power. Then you know, the second group he's going to get. I need you guys to get all EPS and power lines running between here and the bridge back up into emergency systems for when they get the power up. And then he's going to go to the third group and say, congratulations, you're on plug duty. I need every external hall breach and the, the structural integrity of the field back up. Otherwise, we're not getting this thing off this rock. Yes, sir. You have your orders. Get it to it. Yes, sir. And they all scurry off. Um, I'll take Liru. Take Liru. The, uh, yeah. So I think this is the first time uh, we've seen uh, Senior Chief uh, Liru. Uh, Liru. Yeah, she's got no values, no talents. <laughs> yeah, I think this is literally her first appearance. Um, but she is an Orion. Uh, strangely enough, outranks Free Pack, but of course doesn't really pull rank because he's the chief engineer. Uh, but she is very good at engineering. And again, this is her first appearance, so you can uh, stylize her role-playing however you wish. And then, uh, Prier, who would you be taking, or would you be going yourself? That's what I'm looking. Um, with the medical situation pretty much under control, I think Prier could step away for a bit, because he's also the highest science person. Okay. So let's uh, let's have Prier go on this one. Prier. Oh, I'll leave Vara in charge. Okay. What do you get to add to a support character when you first introduce them? Uh, so the first introduction, nothing happens, but because they have uh, finally been activated, subsequent activations, you can start adding to them. All right. But yeah, uh, the five of you uh, gather, and uh, you start heading towards the monolith. And I tell you what, let's take our uh, five to ten minute break here. And when we get back, we will have you arriving at the monolith. So yeah, BRB.
All right, and welcome back from our break. So, uh, we rejoin our intrepid players as they arrive at the base of one of these towering, gigantic monoliths. And now that you guys are closer to the monolith, uh, you realize something very important. Uh, the surface of the monolith is inscribed and etched with glyphs, runes, and other complex designs. And as you stare at them for a little bit, you see that there's almost like a pulsating blue energy running through these designs. Okay, we might as well sort of flip out the tricorder and start doing a quick scan, seeing if you can recognize any energy signatures or, like, linguistic quirks. Okay. Uh, I would say that this can be something that is assistable by one other person. Uh, this is going to be for you, Murthrin, a reason engineering difficulty two. I'll um, assist. You'll assist. Okay, so let's start with that, and then we'll we'll go from there. Alrighty, uh, alien. Alien tech would definitely apply. I am just stopping to make sure I didn't break something when I accidentally scrolled out. No. Um. Can my power yeah. systems focus apply? Since we're looking for a power source, um, I would say it would, yeah. And uh, it was reason science, <laughs> reason science, uh, reason engineering for you, actually. Okay. All right, so uh, Liru's got you one success. And uh, yeah, you know what? We're maxed out on momentum, so I'll spend. What was the difficulty again? Uh, the difficulty is a two. Um, I'll just remind you, though, okay. that if you do end up with extra momentum, you can use it to ask questions. True. Okay, I'll spend three to get two extra dice. Okay. Wow. How about that? So, uh, nice. that means you get those three momentum right back. And yeah, uh, what between uh, Rizazo and Liru, or not Rizazo, uh, Mirthrin and Liru, uh, you look at your tricorder, look back at the monolith, look back at your tricorder, you're pretty sure that this monolith, whatever the hell it is, it's part of a larger, almost machine, like planet-wide machine. And yeah. Mirthrin, you pretty much guessed it earlier, this is either something on a, you know, a Takan or a Preserver or, you know, a very advanced civilization scale of things. Or maybe they're just decoration. You never know. All right. So f first spent momentum for extra information. Mm -hmm. um, do these things specifically look like weapon systems or are they more general than that? Well, since you asked the question with momentum, I will answer truthfully. Uh, you are seeing that there are uh, at least runes or inscriptions that, even though the, the Universal Translator is not translating them specifically, um, strangely enough, you notice what could be the symbol for the god of war in Greek, uh, the symbol of Ares. Uh, I believe that's the Omega symbol, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. um, but you're also seeing it for other gods and other religions and other runes that all lead to, like, war. Um, along, we'll say, a spot about 50 meters off the ground. Um, but you don't see them, you know, a bunch of times. You just see it the one time 50 meters off the ground. All right. Uh, Follow-up question for free, because I'm not studious. Um, is there a row of symbols, uh, that correspond to, uh, gods and figures associated with communication or diplomacy? Uh, yes, there is. And in fact, you see that those are featured more towards the base of the structure. And, uh, you notice that they seem to be pointing, like, there's a, a, a hieroglyphic, uh, I forget the Egyptian god off the top of my head, but, uh, the Egyptian god of knowledge, uh, was that wrong? Uh, Might have been wrong. Uh, Thoth. 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 So you see Thoth, and there's almost an arrow or some form of hieroglyph that points you, uh, to go around the structure, almost like, you know, a, 
a sign would point you in a, in a direction kind of a thing. Uh, um, Ikea floor style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Liru is peering. She's bent over peering at the runes, and she just goes, Wow! There's not even a nanometer discrepancy in these etchings. That's crazy how that they did that. And then she kind of straightens up and she goes, uh, this all kind of overshadows the fact that you just crashed a ship into the planet, huh, Beefy? And then she good-naturedly slaps him on the back. <laughs> Senior Chief, I would advise to use prop to follow proper rank and decorum. Yes, sir, Lieutenant Beef Darvo. <laughs> I just turn and walk in the other direction uh, with a tricorder in hand. Well, um, let, let me know, let me know what you find, Lieutenant Beef Darval. <laughs> well, uh, Lieutenant Beef Darval is your new name, apparently. Uh, you know, as you uh, start to walk around the structure, um, your keen Vulcan ears do pick up what could be some form of communication. Uh, someone talking or some form of music. It's really hard to tell. Um, but you maybe go about another minute and you see that there is a crate uh, about the size of, say, a twin-size bed uh, that is open and leaning up against the monolith. And inside this crate, uh, you see that there are blankets... There are protein packs, or what probably are protein packs. Uh, there's water. Uh, there is what could be a surgical kit. It's you know it's got all like like serrated knives and things that you would expect to find in a surgical kit. And then there's a what you're guessing is a pistol, but it's not of any design you've ever seen before. Captain, I found signs of improvised habitation. Uh, where's the sound coming from? Uh, the conversation or music or whatever it is is coming from further around the monolith. Uh, right now, you're like at the edge of everybody else's vision, so you would have to go out of sight to continue uh, around the monolith. This monolith is like 10 kilometers in perimeter. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. Well, I will wave them over and then I will. I'll draw my phaser mm -hmm. and proceed around the monolith. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, out, of, out of curiosity, does Mirthrun recognize the pistol design? That's a good point. Uh, roll me a Insight Engineering, and I'm going to make this a difficulty four. So it is passable, but uh, it is difficult. Hmm. Now let's... Spend a momentum and hope I get lucky. Okay. I would also like to see if I can do a um, scan to see how old the monolith is. Sure. Oh, I do dear. not get lucky. Wow. Oh, that's I'm quite the opposite uh, of lucky. I'm going to take four threat for that rather than give you complications. Her dice are cold today. Yeah. So, Mirthrin, unfortunately, you get nothing. Uh, but, Prier. It appears uh, to run on some form of electricity. It runs on electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, Prior, what was your question again? Uh, can I date how old the monolith is? Sure. Uh, that would be an insight science difficulty two. Would research methods apply? Uh, I would let archaeology apply if you had archaeology. No. <laughs> I have uh, sensor operation. Shame, you didn't go the Picard and path. Let's see. Uh, Rizazo might be able to assist you with geology, because doesn't Rizazo have geology? Uh, structural engineering more than anything. Hmm. I'll just roll it straight 2d20. If I get it, great. If I don't, oh well. All right. Fair enough. I don't get it. Yeah. Uh, your best guess is that these have stood for millennia, if not longer. I'm actually going to... Yeah, so I'm going to try my own role for that, because actually I do have mineralogy. Okay, go for it. Uh, but I'd like to compare the age of the structure with the age of, like, the kind of the soil and rocks around it. Okay. To see if it was, like, built into this rock, or if the rocks just ended up covering it. Fair question. Uh, was there a role is that? That would be insight science still? Insight science still? Uh, you do have a focus. Hmm. 
I'm going to buy one dice with momentum. Okay. Spending momentum. Ooh. I'm imagining uh, Rizzazzo just sampling the ground and then sampling the monolith like a wine connoisseur. Pretty much that's what I'm doing. I'm walking up and, like, <laughs> licking it while... Uh, curious to see how this... Curious to see how this... That... Very alien archaeotech response to being chewed on. Yeah. The texture uh, is very odd and very dense and rich. There's a fine layer of sediment over everything that is making it hard to get a very particular taste. There is a lot of cross contamination, as it were. And as I sip the wine of the planet, I realize to myself I am suddenly French. <laughs> Uh, but no, uh, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to give you a free advantage. You're a Horda. This is what you do. So I'm going to let that pass. Um, so what you do determine is your actual second hunch that the monoliths were put here first. And it's the rocks, the grass, everything else that was put on top of it. In fact, Rosazo, you're pretty damn sure that this is more a giant machine with spokes coming out of it that has been made to look like a planet. That's that's what I was wondering. All right, yes. It's, it's Captain, Captain, I believe that this is a, a, a giant celestial machine which has a, either been disguised as a planetary body or has simply accumulated dust and sediment over the aeons until it was masked as a planetoid. Matherin right. is silently thankful that Hortas are not te- are not properly telepathic, and so it cannot tell that he is stifling a laugh. <laughs> <clears throat> Captain, if I recall the logs from the Ophion's previous missions, you ran into a you literally ran into a planet that was a planet machine before, correct? Hmm. I ran into a couple, actually. Liru is going to follow the arrow while uh, monitoring the power lines along the rune. Yeah. Uh, actually, sorry, I'm not with you guys, so I've I should not have asked that question. Nah, it's all right. Yeah. I mean, you've got com badges. It's, it's easy enough to ask. Um, I'll so follow gonna... Liru. Okay. So I'm gonna say the let me rearrange tokens here for the marching order. So Zots with two complications. If this does have any similarities to previous encounters, I'm definitely not seeing them. Yep. All right, there we go. All right. So Darval, uh, you are the first to see uh, as you sort of round the corner, as it were. Uh, is that you see what look to be about six humanoid creatures in the distance. Uh, that are at the base of the monolith. And the, you know, thanks to your visor, you're able to zoom in a little bit and get a good look at them. Uh, They are humanoid, but are otherwise clad in these sort of dark, seamless suits of armor that are topped with a horned helmet that obscures their faces. They don't seem to have noticed you at the moment, but they are all, all looking up at the monolith. Hmm. Now, as much as I'm not one for racial profiling, typically things that are wearing darks armor and horned helmets are not one to be to respond well to a person yelling "hello, hello" really loudly. So I shall re- fall back to the captain and report my findings. Okay. So you uh, you pass Liru and Prier on your way back oh. to the captain. I shall relay my findings to them as well. It is inadvisable to proceed. There are six individuals up there, armored and bearing a particularly aggressive countenance. Oh, hmm. oh my. Oh my. Okay, that's honestly a surprise. These ancient megalithic relics of bygone <laughs> mega civilizations tend not to have civilization people living there. Well, s- sir, if I were to extrap, if I were to uh, extrapolate. Uh, this makeshift quarters, as I gesture to where the bed and uh, other things were, presents a possibility that these individuals are also stranded. Hmm, potentially. 
Well, uh, let's let's get a little closer, observe them for a while, see what they do. Okay. Very well, and I will fall back behind the captain. The radio signals that brought us here. Can I pick? See if uh, I'd like to scan with my tricorder to see if I can pick them up. Uh, well, uh, that's going to be a reason science difficulty zero because it's going to be very obvious where they're coming from. All right, so you get a momentum. Uh, yeah, they're coming from this obelisk. All right, I was just making sure that it wasn't from some sort of down ship that they've come from or something. Nope, definitely coming from the obelisk. But yeah, so uh, with you guys observing uh, these individuals from a distance, um, you do notice that the second time you come into view, uh, a few of them do look in your direction, but they make no movements that would indicate that they're drawing weapons. Mm, excuse me, or otherwise caring about your presence. It's almost like a sidelong glance that just turns to them looking back up at the monolith, almost as if they're ignoring your presence. So I guess the next question is, how long do we watch them before we eventually decide to approach? Mm -hmm. Well, up to you, Captain. Well, they don't seem particularly to care that we're here, Captain. Uh, Leroy's just going to stand right up. I assume that we were like, like above a dune or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do, do, then, doing the classic Starfleet croucher behind the ridge. Exactly. Uh, are we s still like receiving the radio signal since it's you know emitting from this? Yep. Can I attempt to translate it using my trill um, talent because my second host was trained in sound harmonics? Hmm. Fair. I will say this will be a difficult role, but it is possible. I kind of want to try it. Okay. So this would be a... I think this would be either a daring or an insight plus science. And the difficulty here is the only reason that you're able to even attempt this is because of the trill focus. Um, otherwise it would be impossible, but I'm going to set the difficulty here at a five. All right. So I have a focus because, you know, trill talent, mm -hmm. um, none of my other talents come into play. I am going to I think, burn my determination. Okay. Uh, eager to please. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, so two automatic successes and then... It's two for an additional die. Mm -hmm. I'll do that. Okay. Daring, science. Whew. And you have cautious science, don't you? I have cautious medicine. Ooh, okay. Uh, do you want to challenge a value to get another point of determination? Or maybe does Mirthrin want to give you his determination? I think I can probably do that. All right. Uh, ooh, mm. Actually, I don't think you've got any values that really apply here. I don't think you have to as the captain. I think as captain, you can literally just point at someone and say, you have my determination. Yeah. Priya, you have my determination. <laughs> All right, I will call in that determination using the value I must find the root of the problem. Okay. And yeah, you can reroll as many dice as you wish. Dare it. Zion. I'll reroll both zeros. Okay. Worth Much it. better result. So that is a grand total of six successes, which means you are at three total momentum, I believe. And yeah, uh, you don't get a full language, uh, but you do get enough. Uh, it is a repeating signal, or a not a signal, a repeating message. And the message says, uh, how do I say this without spoiling it? The message says, uh, primary power unit failing, please send maintenance crew immediately. 
Captain? Yes? I was able to decipher some of what the radio signal is. Uh, good news or bad news? I would say neither. Although, I don't understand why. It, the What it translates to is his primary power is failing. Send maintenance crew. At least that's what I'm able to find. Oh, well, makes sense for uh, something as old as this. Um, what I don't understand well, is... Been able to, if you've been able to get some manner of uh, the beginnings of a translation going, maybe we can try <clears throat> replying, trying to send it a, just a, a hail of a message received. It, I can attempt. See if we can get a, uh, a response to it. I don't understand, though, if they were trying to send... Uh, if the message is saying to send maintenance um, crew, that it would shoot us down. Well, I mean, ancient alien, ancient alien structure, clearly on a scale that we don't deal with. For all we know, it might have been trying to catch us in a docking tractor beam. It would not be the first time that such a signal has been misinterpreted, Captain. There, with the Dyson Sphere and the Genelin. Hmm. All right. Try, try and establish contact. Hi, sir. Liru, Liru uh, kind of just, like leans down and goes, good job, Spots. You did it. And then she ruffles his hair. <laughs> Gotta love it, Ryan. All right. So, uh, Prayer, I'm going to say that uh, you can do a control and a science at a difficulty of two to send a message uh, back towards this monolith. Uh, but I do want you to be very clear on what the message says. Um, I feel like uh, it should be something straightforward, like message received, sending crew. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good idea. Then they might open up a hatch and we can get into it. Kind of my thought. All right. So, would my uh, the focus with the sound harmonic still come into play since I'm responding? Yeah, I think uh, doesn't that last for the scene? Yep. It lasts for the scene, yes. Yeah, then it definitely would apply. Um, <clears throat> and I am going to buy a third die. Okay. You're a maestro with the waveform spots. Very nice. Uh, two successes. Uh, you get that momentum right back. And yeah, uh, what happens is uh, you send this signal back at the monolith, and you see that almost like a uh, a flood of uh, of glowing <clears throat> lights lights up along the monolith closest to you, and it starts sort of uh, at the top and just works its way down in a waterfall formation. And then the etchings sort of coalesce as they reach the bottom level. They coalesce into a door-shaped aperture. And part of the monolith uh, actually shows a crack. And it opens up into a passageway. However, uh, as this happens, uh, those six individuals that, uh, you know, were just sort of not paying you any mind... The moment this happens, they begin sprinting in your direction. Uh, I'm thinking maybe we get in quickly? Uh, yes. And Jester, uh, I have something very specific for you, since you are the security individual. Uh, you should now have a handout in Roll20. Should be at the very top of the handouts. Uh, as we're sprinting, Lyra wants to just yell at them, You snooze, you lose! Don't entice them! She's an Orion, antagonizing is their default state. I thought that was a arousal. <laughs> Same thing! You'd is be it? surprised what works for certain species. I mean, take the Klingons, for example. I, this was not an invitation for um, further extrapolation. Especially since we're running for our life. <laughs> Save it for the Darbo table. <clears throat> okay. Right. So, 
I find that comparison highly offensive, Captain. Yeah, write, write a disciplinary, write a disciplinary report if we survive this. Yeah, Rosazzo's just gonna beeline it into the the monolith. Okay, just he uh, was positioning him. himself in front of the, the the captain, and then he just kind of quivers for a second and just turns tail and flees. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the good news is that you are able to make it inside, and the doorway does seal itself behind you uh, before the uh, six individuals do make it to you. Uh, you don't even hear them uh, uh, attacking the door or otherwise banging on it, though they probably are. Um, but yeah, you guys are in a corridor made of the same material that the monolith itself is made out of. Uh, it is a darker stone or almost an obsidian. And the lighting is provided by um, more runes that are on the walls and the ceilings. Same sort of blue. <clears throat> All right, let's look for the arrows, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I'm I, rushing ahead. Rushing ahead. Well, okay. Not facing it. With no light on. No uh, light Lieutenant, on. where are you going? You jazz us! Uh, my Klingon's a little rusty, but I think that was something along the lines of Tally Ho. He's a bit more crude, and quite honestly, what he called Lieutenant of all was out of line. So anyway. I just shrug. Uh, Rosazzo, since you are rushing forward, um, you turn a corner. You know, it's 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 a, it's the same passageway. There are no branching points, but it does kind of curve around a corner. You turn a corner, and then all of a sudden, um, you are zapped by an energy beam as uh, a security system of some sort activates. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm going to roll some challenge dice here. Okay. Uh, I believe you do have innate resistance to energy attacks, yes? Uh, yes. So well, at least one. how much resistance is that? Is it one uh, resistance? Is it two? Two. Two to energy. Two to energy. Okay. So you're only going to take three stress of damage, and this blast is enough to knock you back so that the others see you uh, and you all see him get knocked blast back by a, a energy blast of some sort. It's also enough to end the effect that I just told you about. <clears throat> there was also going to sit there quivering the for a second. You're not quite sure what it looks like when a horda shakes their head to clear their, their head but this is probably something similar they're like a dog, where there's kind of a rippling that starts at one end and kind of goes to the other end. Brian. And I got the mental image of a horse sort of shaking itself like a dog shaking the water out of this fur. It's... I... It's an adorable mental image. Uh, Liru has uh, obviously drawn her phaser in one hand, but with the tricorder in her other one, she'd like to determine... Uh, in any energy buildups that would indicate where the source of the fire came. Okay, uh, that's going to be an insight security difficulty two. That's uh, Captain. I would urge caution. My mind was not my own for a moment there. That was all. What was the overwhelming was compulsion to get to the center of the monolith? Hmm. Sounds that, that, like that some it. sort of psychic GPS map gone awry. Mm -hmm. What was that role? Uh, inside security. Alright, nice. so you get a momentum. And yeah, you're able to determine that the area just past Rosazzo uh, is set up with what is essentially a trap. Uh, it is specifically designed that any living organism that passes through that portion of the tunnel will trigger the trap, which will then blast the intruder with a disintegration ray. Ooh, very oh, you got 
it it uh, it would be fatal to any non horta. You got lucky there, pudding. Yes. All right. Let's see if we can't uh, convince it to turn itself off. Well, I'm not detecting any nearby interfaces, Captain, but perhaps we could set a phaser to a specific uh, intensity in order to disable it. Yeah, that could definitely work. Let's give it a go. From a fashion maintenance. From a scan, can we tell if it's a continuous buildup or if there's kind of like a recharge time? Um, it looks like that the power is constant, uh, almost like a, a light turned on. Uh, it's not obviously firing continuously, but uh, it does look like it could fire back to back if need be. But there is a threshold in which passing it through mm -hmm. will cause it to fire. Correct. Well, I'd like to stand uh, on the safe side of that threshold mm -hmm. uh, with with the corner kind of protecting me around the corner mm -hmm. and fire at the point that the uh, that shot came. Okay. Uh, this is going to be a control plus security, because you're firing a phaser. Uh, the is there a setting I could set the phaser to to help me do this? Um, I would say no, if only because of the material that's involved here. Like, right. even if you put it to maximum, um, your scans up to this point indicate would indicate that this material is phaser resistant. Um... So I'm going to make this a difficulty three, control security, and then it's going to determine if you hit, if it will determine, you know, we have to roll for damage and see if you do enough damage kind of a thing. I'd like to spend the momentum to get an extra die. Okay. All right, so that's two successes. Uh, do you, well, Liru doesn't have a determination, uh, so she can't re-roll that. Um, so what happens is, Liru, you fire it where the disintegration ray is supposed to come out of, but it just doesn't do anything. Like, the obsidian-like material doesn't even react to it. Fudge nuggets. <laughs> Language. Is there... <laughs> it's... Well, um... There must be some sort of triggering mechanism, if we cannot... Actually, did, the does the beam come from multiple... Multiple points or from a specific point? Uh, it comes from multiple. Perhaps okay. if we... That idea. Uh, perhaps if we respond or send some sort of deactivation signal through using the uh, sonic interface that uh, Lieutenant Commander Preer had discovered. Yep. Darvala, right, let's... you beat me to it. Yeah, so, see, something like uh, please deactivate security system precisely uh, we can try that I was also kind of thinking all the symbolism on the spire there's a lot of uh, symbols to gods of war I'm wondering if like that's a code basically to, like a security system code to go through uh, one last thing the, there were a whole bunch of symbols for various gods of war, but also gods of communication, gods of... You know what? Try... Sin... Hmm. I'm thinking... I want, to try, I want to try something. And Mithrin is going to sort of reach out, place a hand on the wall of the corridor, mm -hmm. and then just sort of close his eyes and just start chanting a traditional... Vulcan meditation prayer or something. Okay. Uh, if I understand your your goal here, yeah. you want to mentally interface with the obelisk. Yes. Okay. Uh, ba basically project an air of uh, sort of peace and calm. Yep, sort of a pil pilgrim, uh, pilgrim supplicating whichever spiritual entity applies to them. Okay. Uh, I would say that this is going to be a presence plus command difficulty four. Alrighty. Uh, would psychic phenomena apply? Most definitely. Okie dokie. Uh, okay, if I spend all three of those momentum to boost my roll? Sure. I'd say go for it. He asks the party. Is 
a presence command. Four dice. Oh, so close. So oh. close. Uh, I'll tell you what. I'll let this succeed at cost, but I am going to take threat for it if if it does. Uh, I'm okay with that. Is everyone else okay with that? Yep. Sure. Alrighty. L l let's see what interesting thing happens. So, Mirthrin, you reach out with your mind and you try to connect with the obelisk, maybe not expecting anything in return. And I'm going to use a 40k reference here uh, because I'll know you'll get it. It's almost like the first time a Psyker connects with the warp. Uh, it What Ooh, you get no. back is an oh, unimaginable no. amount of information, and it doesn't make sense. What you're getting back does not make any sense. And it's enough that you are almost literally flung back from the wall that you're touching, and you're going to take... Uh, let's roll some challenge dice here. You're going to take three damage... But, at the same time, the portion of the corridor that holds the trap, uh, it is going to illuminate red for a moment, and then return to blue. So, Mirthron will just sort of, like, reel back from the wall, stagger back, probably collapse onto the floor. Mm -hmm. I run over. Yep, yeah, and he's just sort of gonna hold his head like he's got the world's biggest migraine and go, oh, Okay, accessing every single file in a cultural database probably not the oh ow oh oh i'm not sure. sure how to describe this but it feels like every single neuron in my brain is trying to connect to every single other neuron we don't need you ascending to a different plane of existence now we already had that yeah. once yeah, so let, 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 let's leave the accidental ascensions to Jensen. Liru would like to uh, use the tricorder to determine where the, essentially where the sensor that would detect the um, the passage through the uh, the 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 area which activates the the trap is, and then. Uh, just completely bathe it in errant data. Just, just like try to send as much r irrelevant sensor readings to it. Kind of just overwhelm the sensor in order to basically blind it. Okay. Uh, before you do that, though, uh, Rosazo, I would like you to roll me an insight security since you are our resident tactical officer, and see if you gain any insight on this. And I'm not going to tell you the difficulty here, uh, but you know you don't have any momentum. So, if you wanted additional dice, it would be involve threat. You know, um, inside security. Mm -hmm. I I do have bold, so I can reroll if I buy one from uh, threat. So I'm gonna buy that extra dice with threat. Okay. Uh, let's see, <clears throat> structural engineering as a focus, maybe. Sure. Or. Okay, don't need to buy it. Wow. Oh, nice. All right. You get two momentum from that. And yeah, uh, what you figure out, Rosalzo, just staring at the, the readings you're getting back from your tricorder, you're pretty sure that that red flash was indicative of the trap deactivating. It potentially is safe for you to proceed. I'm going to throw a hyperspray at it. it. Nothing happens. It should only trigger from living things. <clears throat> Should be deactivated now. I believe that. Yeah. Then, then. Yeah, I think it worked. Like, I I don't think it was rejecting the input so much as it was just like I was essentially trying to plug a calculator into a computer core. There's there's only one way to be sure. Rosazo slides forward. Nothing happens. Liru will stand from behind the corner and follow, and as she passes the captain, she goes, uh, I wouldn't recommend disabling all the traps that way, Cap. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not in no hurry to try that again. But, uh, long story short, a penitent man may pass. I help Captain Merthyrn up. 
I will bring up the rear. And actually, uh, you beat me to the punch. The What I was going to tell you, Mirthrin, was that uh, the one thought that you would have gotten from all that jumble was that the way was open to those who are worthy of power. So you were pretty close. Okay, so slightly modify the reference to make that more clear. Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, the good news is, though, is that after a few more turns, uh, you arrive in what would be probably be the central control chamber uh it is pentagonal in nature and has the same blue markings that cover the outside and interior of the monolith and you know this is a control room because there are panels displays and controls uh spread throughout the room and all surfaces are covered in such great amounts of dust that it's very obvious that no one's been here in quite a long period of time and as you step in a holographic display uh, in the middle of the room activates to show a 3D representation of the star system that you are currently in. Alrighty, there, let's start by trying to pinpoint where the system's problem is. It's Sorry. giving us a 3D uh, display of the system. Is there uh, an interface that this is uh, displaying from? Well, uh, since Mirthrin, uh, I think between Mirthrin just getting a data spike and Preer having some translation, uh, you are seeing uh, also symbology mm-hmm. that would represent uh, some form, because I'm trying to think how it would be in, in ancient glyphs. Um, you're seeing knowledge, so you're seeing Thoth again. Um, you're also seeing Ra. You're also seeing, uh, what's the other one that opposes Ra? You're seeing Apophis or a pet. Uh, Seth, maybe? Set? Uh, Seth's God of the Underworld, I think. Apophis right, you're not seeing any, you're not seeing Death. You're not seeing Set. Yeah. You're not seeing Cerberus. You're yeah. not seeing Apophis, Hades. I think, is God of the Moon. Yes, you are seeing Apoph. So you are, or Apep. You are seeing of the Moon. So we have Ra of the Sun and Epic of the Moon. Lyra is going to tap on the one displaying Thoth. Okay. So, uh, interestingly, a jumble of uh, light that doesn't really coalesce into a being, um, but it's almost like a glowing ball of shimmering light. And in a language that Preer and Mirthrin understand, it says... Are you the maintenance crew that was sent to repair this facility? I send a signal saying yes. Okay. It says, highlighting areas that are in need of repair. And uh, what happens to everybody else is, uh, on the holographic display of the system, it zooms in rapidly to the planet you're on, and you see almost an, an orbital view of all the monoliths, And several of the monoliths begin to illuminate red. Uh, There are three in all that appear to be in equilateral positions around the planet. Hmm. Captain, we did not bring enough repair materials to fix all these monoliths. Well, let's see if we can identify. No, we did not. Uh, Sorry, Priya, you were saying? I was going to say, let's see if we can get a little bit more knowledge and see what the. Okay. Yep. Uh, are any of the monoliths anywhere close to our position? Uh, no, these would be if, let's say, for example, uh, your monolith is on the northern hemisphere, uh, maybe up towards, uh, I'm trying to remember where things work on a globe, uh, almost up towards where the United States meets Canada, up in that latitude. Um, these monoliths that you're seeing are more towards the equator. Okay. Uh,. Well, I mean, it doesn't hurt to ask, but uh, let's see if these monoliths have any kind of internal transportation system. Okay. So... is going to tap on one of the glowing monoliths. Okay. To see Which... if that will bring up a, a bigger display of it, of it. So, just to be clear, you're tapping on one of the red monoliths, not right. one of the blue monoliths. One of the red ones. Okay. okay. So, you tap on one of the red ones, and... It, too, uh, rotates the image so that the monolith is straight up, and it zooms in. 
And it begins a, a holographic flyby of the monolith with these lines coming off of it with uh, glyphs and text that, again, Murthrin and Preer understand. And the glyphs are indicating that, uh, you know, basically the, the power units are in need of replacement. Uh, and probably what's the most important here is not so much what the repair information is as in the fact that it specifically says wormhole generator offline. Well, that's information I wasn't expecting. What's it say, Spot? Well, well it first off says that their the power uh, supply needs replaced. But the next line is wormhole generator offline. They were just left a very long whistle. Well, replacing power uh, systems, we're, we're, we're not going to be able to do that. I mean, just, just mm -hmm. flat out. You'd need to call in a I mean, I mean, Yeah, there's, there's no way we'll be able to provide just a, enough raw power. And I don't know, even with time to reverse engineer these systems, I doubt we could get it. But, you know, maybe we can sort of do a patch job of some kind it's enough that would let this facility self-maintain for the indefinite future so uh Mithrin's gonna look through and like figure out okay what's the most pressing thing as far as this automated system concerned like the thing that needs to get fixed before anything else breaks uh definitely the connection between the uh planet's power core and the monolith and uh and, sort of uh, to give you a better idea of what that is um, if you're familiar at all with geothermal sort of heating and power generation, mm -hmm. um, kind of the same thing here where these sort of great conduits go to the, the planet's core and literally feed off the churning molten metal that's there. <clears throat> so all right. Well, those need to be fixed. Yeah, and so Mertron still looks good and goes, well, the, how these power systems work is a little beyond my capacity, but... Uh, and he'll sort of pour, sort of tap at one of the conduits. I recognize an EPS conduit bypass job when I see one. So you want us to bypass the failing systems? Yes, I mean, look, 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 look at this one here, and he'll sort of, like, point, point up here. So, see how there's, like, all of the systems have secondary redundancies and the critical ones have tertiary redundancies? Right. I'm thinking if we take a couple of these systems here, any sort of points there and there, we should be able to use those to patch the primary circuits that are failing here. And uh, obviously that'll mean those systems are more vulnerable to failure in the future, but uh, it'll be enough to keep the system going for a couple of centuries at least. You're making them I slightly less efficient in order to get the power where they need to go. I definitely exactly. see a couple places along the lines that we could divert or make a couple of uh, disconnections. And it'd be an easier job than replacing the power systems outright. But can I make a second suggestion? Mm hmm We could attempt to shut the entire system down. And then that would prevent them from uh, basically doing what they did to us when we got here. And then we could come back at another time with with more resources. Hmm. Actually, that is a good point. While we're here, uh, maybe we can figure out what the system was actually trying to do. Like, was it a defense mechanism? Was it a attempt at communication gone awry? Well, uh, uh, if uh, you say that out loud, uh, the glowing ball says this facility is ready to answer any queries posed to it again in a language only you and Prier understand ah, well that's convenient and uh, Merthyr will sort of go up to it um, when our ship came into orbit we were severely damaged by some sort of energy pulse from the planet uh, sort of gives approximate position at t position and time Mm -hmm. uh, requesting information on what that was exactly vessel was detected in orbit 
tractor beam was attempted. However, vessel was not as expected. Vessel crash landed approximately three units away. Hmm. That makes sense. I'd imagine this facility is used to ships of a much larger scale. Or so, of a different nature. Um, Alright, so Mathur will sort of go with it. Alright, uh, I am going to upload a schematic of our proposed temporary repair r- repair scheme to address the most critical areas, submitting for approval. And he's sort of like tapping away on the tricorder and sort of sending a generic sort of all, all hails and frequencies transmission. Gotcha. Uh, so, uh, as you, uh, send this message, um, the rest of you do see that the, uh, sort of the conduits he had pointed out, the, the repair scheme that he, he basically outlined is literally being, being enacted, um, you know, despite any sort of movements on your part. And, uh, what's probably the most important is is that the little red line that says wormhole generation offline, it ticks over to green. Aha. Uh-huh. You did something, Cap. What, what does that say? It's getting uh, really that says boring, wormhole right? generator online. How come you guys understand what's going on and it doesn't seem to be translating to the rest of us? Because we're well, special. Uh, and Mercer will sort of actually look confused at that. Wait. Wait, what? So you haven't been understanding it this whole time? Not a word. No. I mean, Liru was hearing it as well, so I just assumed everyone else could hear it. Computer, are you capable of speaking a language that we all can comprehend? So, again, in a language that you don't, it says... Uh, if query is understood from individual located at... And it gives a set of coordinates where Draval is standing. An upload of a appropriate language would suffice. Uh, I think it's saying you need to sort of plug your brain into it in order for it to be able to translate for you. I do come equipped with a universal translator device. We could insert that instead. Mm, I mean, g- given the how extensive this thing's... <clears throat> cultural database seems to be yeah the standard universal translator pack it should, okay. should be more than enough i mean all of our combat just come equipped with a universal translator so without asking i'm just going to unclip mine clip it to the uh, some place on the panel and see what happens okay so uh, as soon as you set uh the combat down on one of the panels a sort of cascading uh, ripple goes out from it like you place it in water. So like a blue ripple goes across it. And then a language everybody understands, language accepted. Uh-huh. Way to go, beefcake. Thank you, Greeny. <laughs> she scowls. <laughs> right, well, I guess the... Well, I guess the most pressing issues are over. Now now we just need to get the ship operational again and, I don't know, maybe send a call to the Amalthia for help. Perhaps get out of here without being attacked by those people in the armor. I'd ah. hate to get... Yeah, that's a good a, point. I'd hate to get too overly optimistic here, Captain. But I am certain I wasn't the first one who's heart left when wormhole generator was mentioned yeah i've been specifically not pinning too much on that but uh i mean i mean it would be awfully convenient problem is there's a lot more things to do in the meantime before we get to that point so Hmm. well in the meantime Maybe we can establish some sort of uh, signal we can send to the planet in future to let them know that uh, the ship in question is not structurally rigorous enough to be tractor-beamed in. Well, why don't we just 
upload a schematic of the type of ships that we have. I'm guessing that they were much more used to heavier ships, possibly um, way different materials. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll need to get back to the Europa and download some files from the computer. I mean, I don't exactly carry Federation sk- ship schematics around on my tricorder, but... Uh... Wait a second, Captain. And leader will step forward. Computer, do you have a scan of the ship you attempted to transport her at time mark? And then she'll rattle it off. Hmm. Yes, a scan was conducted of the vessel. It was deemed a Type 2 vessel. Please integrate the Type 2 vessel scans into your uh, allowed database and uh, um, and remove it from uh, your your bank that I, I don't know. I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say it's uh remove it from all our uh, transport our uh, trans uh tractor uh tractor beam. Yeah, protocol. Mark is not tractor beam safe. Not okay. Uh yes, and it says query accepted. Class two vessels will no longer be tractor beamed. Well, then she'll dust her hands. She's, that takes care of that. Oh, that makes the Callisto classes safe to fly in. Well, now on to the next problem. Have there been any other class two or similar ships that have been tractor beamed in the last few cycles? Yes. A vessel was tractored approximately 17 cycles ago. Computer display record of this ship. All right. So it does show you a, uh, a schematic of an unknown alien ship. And you notice that, uh, very importantly, that schematic is of a caretaker ship. Where was this class two vessel trans uh, tractored to, computer? Uh, it the hollow display kind of poofs out from being just centered on one monolith, and it shows a impact point uh, approximately five kilometers or kilometers. I can never say it right. Uh, five km from the monolith that you're currently in on the opposite side of the uh, Europa. Hmm. <clears throat> Well, well, we know, that is worryingly convenient. We know the caretakers will assimilate in, uh, any r- r- raw mater- material in order to regenerate, so... That might, explain how some attempt- the dam- that might explain some of the damage. It's, it's entirely possible, sir, that them. this damage was just caused by age. This would mm-hmm. be an interesting opportunity to meet perhaps some individuals behind the caretakers true um computer can you give us a visual of the outside of this monolith and again hollow image whirls to show you the external of the monolith and it's probably what you're expecting uh these six creatures (laughs) are banging and shooting and otherwise doing their damnedest to get into this monolith but they're uh they're not making a scratch all right, uh, computer. Do you have any languages on file listed as that? Be, ah. Do you have these creatures' language listed on file? Creatures are identified on file. They are known as, and then there's a glitch where it's a, bun- a burst of static. They are identified as static. They also go by the colloquial name caretakers. That is interesting. Human form caretakers. I am um, apparently the caretakers are not just simply drone ships. Computer, uh, take visual, take scans of the class two caretaker vessel and add them to the uh, hostile defense grid protocol. Such query will require a level three clearance code, security clearance code. Please input code immediately. Shoots and ladders. Well, it was worth a try. Disregard, disregard. Uh, last request. Put the ship designated to caretaker ship under the extra tractor beam uh, designation. It requires extra tractor beams to bring it down. Throw it into the ground harder. <laughs> yeah, 
Understood. Uh, additional power will be rerouted to the tractor beam. That is amusingly devious. Uh, in the meantime, though, I'd actually be curious to try and establish some sort of communication with these things. The caretakers we've encountered have just absolutely refused to uh, give us the time of day. Maybe now they will. What I'm hearing is we need to try to get in contact with those individuals outside. Yes. Uh, computer, can you establish an external communication line to uh, uh, to the position on the obelisk where the caretakers are? A channel has been opened. Unidentified aliens, this is Captain Savik Murthran of the USS Amalthea. Do you understand me? So the uh, the creatures stop what they're doing, uh, look up at the monolith, and they do something that you probably, you know, puts a pit in your stomach. They literally begin prostrating themselves and bowing to the monolith. Congratulations, Ooh, Captain! You uh, have that... bound. You have ascended to godhood. That is unfortunate. Um... Well, let's not let this go to your head. Yeah, no, I'm just going to cut the communication channel. Computer, do you have any internal matter transference systems? Wormhole generation is available. I'm thinking more local. Do you have uh, what we call transporter technology? The breakdown of a matter at an atomic level and then uh, transference to another location. Wormhole generation is available. I'll take that as a no. Um, I think it's implying the wormhole generation is advanced enough to be used at a local level, which is mildly terrifying. <laughs> you bear that thing that lightly. Breaks several laws of laws of uh, local physics and planetary geology. We're in the gamma oh, quadrant. Man. That happens normal. This is true. Um, you know what? I don't really feel like letting these people into the command center, so... You know what? Let's try extending the olive branch and retreating back if it ends badly. Establish communication. Caretakers, stand up. We'll be out momentarily. All right. So you uh, reestablish communication. You say that. Uh, the caretakers do not stand up. Uh, they continue prostrating themselves before the monolith. Well, it was worth the shot. Uh, uh, computer, uh, open up a uh, portal approximately 10 meters, 10 meters to the left of the caretakers. Portal generation successful. Please direct your attention to the portal chamber. And literally one part of the wall opens up. And I've been scrambling to try and find a, a good image for this because I didn't think you'd get this far. Uh, but you eventually see uh, something that looks a little bit like this. Yes, I did steal it from Metroid Prime. I love Metroid. Sue me. Uh, but you see something a little bit like this. And in the middle uh, is where you would assume the wormhole would be. And sure enough, as you look, uh, there's, a, there's a flash of light, a spark of energy. And a, a micro wormhole, a tear in reality, is opened up. And almost like the game portal itself, uh, a light uh, green portal opens up. And uh, on the other side of this portal, you see clear as day uh, the external sort of facing outwards uh, rest of the planet. Lyra waves at the prostrating caretaker. Uh, they, when they notice you, uh, they stand up. Uh, they look between the monolith. They look at you. And then they all level their weapons ready to fire. Close portal. Yeah, portal closes just as you hear the firing of energy beams, but none of it comes through. Okay, this is going to be complicated. Captain, if I may make a suggestion. Uh, suggestions would be welcome. Perhaps first contact is not a 
amenable solution right now. Perhaps we are we could be able to reconfigure the wormhole to deposit us and the remains of the Europa uh, within close proximity to the Amalthea. And that is a good point, actually. Um, a computer, approximate range of wormhole generation system. Wormhole generation is applicable out to 50,000 light years. Dear God. Okay. Which, you uh, know, no. if, you, if you didn't know already, uh, the radius of the Milky Way is about 100, so. Yeah. Well, I'm, Captain. I'm pretty, sure, I'm pretty sure that's enough range to get us to Deep Space Nine. Actually, right. it's enough to literally put you in Paris, France. Captain, <laughs> I would definitely recommend we uh, shore up the Europa before we attempt such a thing. We also I think so. Uh, in the meantime, up. though, we do have an easy way of getting to and from the Europa. Uh, Jester, you so were saying? It's, we absolutely could not let the caretakers have this. I agree. Uh, which leads to the awkward situation of what do we do with them? May I make a suggestion? You may. Computer, identify caretaker homeworld. Uh, it uh, it zooms out, uh, and then as it's sort of like a spiral arm of the galaxy, uh, it shifts a little bit and then zooms in again. And you see caretaker homeworld located presently at coordinates, and it gives you a string of coordinates. Uh, quick chug, Darval. Uh, these coordinates are approximately uh, 100 light years distant. Duly noted. Captain, these, this will take rough... If we were to travel to this location by conventional warp at uh, warp 9, it would take us roughly uh, uh, roughly 33 days. Miru would like to record all of that, uh, the, the spanning and then the location of the homeworld on her tra trans uh, her, her tricorder, I gotcha. <clears throat> May I suggest yeah. opening a wormhole and sending them back home? I mean, that would be convenient, but then that would attract more. The caretakers, attention. yeah, the caretakers then know the location of this planet. But if, uh, uh, I would recommend that we just let them try to get in. They have been obviously unsuccessful in their attempts so far. Yeah, I mean, they've been here for seventeen years. I can't imagine they'll get much more done in another seven months. Alternative suggestion, Captain. There are other empty planets in this system. True. Uh, that would remove the Although, here's the thing, though. <clears throat> are they robotic, or are they in suits? Judging from their actions, sir, I would say that they are at least partially organic, of organic mind. Hmm. Computer, could you locate planets within this local system with similar atmosphere to this? There are no suitable locations that match this planet. How about How two about... or three systems out? There are approximately three planets that meet your criteria. I'm, so, I'm guessing one of them is Sothia. Yep. How many of them contain existing intelligent life? Two. Two. Please display the planet lacking into uh, sentient or or, or living uh, beings, but with comparable atmosphere to this. Okay, so basically ones without life, same atmosphere. Right. Yeah. Uh, again, zooms out, zooms back in, and Darval and uh, Liru, you would know that this is again uh, maybe about uh, another 60 to 75 light years out. Uh, but it zooms in on a Class M planet, and it says, Planet Sigma Sigma 7-0 is located here. Can the wormhole generators in this facility transport an entire Class II vessel? Wormhole generation is able to accommodate up to Class VIII vessels. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, I'm going to 
guess that includes a Malthusized. Precise seven. Uh, <laughs> well, Callisto's a class um, of three. Would it be possible to move the caretakers and their ship to the planet? If they were uncooperative. Oh, we'll say you say it in a way that the computer understands yep. and says, yes, this is a possible out or not possible outcome. This is a possible uh, task. Alrighty. And Merthyn will sort of look around at the others. So if the gives, <laughs> gives a thumbs up. The ear gives a thumbs up. <clears throat> I nod. Computer, transport, caretaker ship, and all caretaker personnel on planet to planet Sigma Sigma 7-0. Understood. Wormhole generation commencing. And as you uh, notice, now that you're not focused on like the miniature like small gateway, uh, you do see that one or more of the displays lights up and begins connecting almost like string filaments to uh, the current planet and the planet that's in question that you're transporting them to. It creates almost like a holographic bridge between them. Uh, and then uh, the lines recede and the computer reports caretakers have been removed from planet. Bye-bye. It's uh... Right. Well then, uh, I think that resolves all the immediate concerns. I suppose we get back to repairing the Europa and... I have one heck of a captain's report to write. Computer, how much power did that consume of remaining? What percentage of remaining power did creating that wormhole use? Remaining power is at 34%. Enough to send one Class 8 vessel yes. a distance of 5,000 or 50,000 light years. Additional repair work is required if power reserves are to remain nominal. Highlight additional repair work. Yeah, highlights the monoliths again. Well, it looks like that's the task ahead of us. We just bring the Amalthia and get our repair teams working. Okay, well, this only leaves one dilemma. How do we let the engineering crew that n know that we don't need the Graviton catapult after all? <laughs> yeah, that's... Hmm... I suggest that we leave that up to the Admiral, Captain. Uh, Mithrin sort of gets an evil grin at that. Alright. Uh, SCPO to Liru, I mean, at Liru to Ears, and she'll, she'll come. Uh, yeah, what do you want? Uh, how, how's the status on the repairs? Uh, at, what, at what point would he, uh, the repairs have gotten to this one? Uh, you've maybe done about two, three hours of work. Uh, not much. You want a status report? <laughs> yeah, right. This thing is toast. Tell Darval uh, he really did a job on this one. He's going to have to hit the simulators again. All right. So, what's our what's our plan there? I mean, we are in no immediate danger. We can. I uh, my suggestion would be that we structurally, uh, sa that we st ah, structurally uh, repair the Europa and uh, seal it to space, and then transport, and then initiate a transport. In the meantime. I'm going to see if this facility has a library. All right. Well, uh, I actually think this is a perfect opportunity to sort of uh, not end, but delay. That way we can get Walter on these shenanigans next time. So mm -hmm. uh, to anyone watching on Twitch or YouTube, this is where I'm going to end the stream. So thank you so much for watching, and we will see you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.